Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening y'all? Today, my good friend from a distance from the media, social media, of course, Mark McMahon in the lab. Did I get that right? You Mark, did indeed. Yes, welcome did. to the lab. So if you guys are watching this, actually, uh, we do this thing mirroring, you know, whenever you're across the uh, negotiation table, we try to, you know, I'm wearing my white tee, you know, it's actually a Henley. Is it a Henley? Is that what they call them? With little... Anyways, I didn't I quite know. get it right. <laughs> I'm asking you, Mark. Part. You wouldn't know, right? Every day. I've got 25 of them. So. <laughs> so this is the lab attire. We got our gloves on, mitts on. We got a white coat. But no, we're, we're so excited, guys. Um, I feel like I was just telling Mark offline. I feel like and I've known him personally. And, and you guys who are watching the show, you guys know I like to engage with whoever. Uh, you know, if there's a synergy or good energy and you just connect and um, so I won't let the serendipity go to waste and say that is how we met on Instagram. Uh, you're but right. you're doing some wonderful things out in Orange County. And I want to dive into that. But before I, like, before I even dive into this, because this is now you're in my backyard. We're talking social yeah, no media doubt. for a little bit. So no yeah. how often do you use it? And how, how often do you take the opportunity to meet, meet individuals like me? Is this a new thing you've been doing? Or am I, this is not I your started, first rodeo. I started doing this, I, I would have to say, about nine months ago. Wow. And... Um, now it's kind of taken on a life of its own as far as, yeah. as far as social, as far as social media goes. I'm, I'm typically on, you know, a couple of these three or four a week, maybe. And, um, none is well put together and not with people as handsome, quite, quite, <laughs> quite so handsome as yourself, but, um, Why, thank you. it's, it's just, it's just been, I'm just been having a ball with it. I, 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 I don't know what direction it's going, but. I put out a video every day for people. I do posts every day. Uh, Rick Jarman and I have a live show every Wednesday night. Oh, very um, nice. We just have a good time with it. You know, we're just. That's yeah. what it's about. That's what it's about. And we'll get into that because you have a very interesting uh, background. Uh, you know, I see the real estate agent, I see the flipper, educator, mm -hmm. uh, investor. Let's, let's take a step back. Which one came first? Uh, contractor. Interesting. Contractor by trade. All right. Talk to me about that. So you're, you're a contractor. How long ago now? How, how long has it been? Uh, I'm uh, 12 years old and nice my dad has a construction company and I'd been going to work with him on the weekends. And that was when he said, it's time to take the bus to work instead of taking the bus home. So I would take the bus. We had a shop up in a, a mountain town called Big Bear, a little town up yeah. in the mountains. And, uh, you know, I just started off there. Tried college after I graduated from high school for about a year. That didn't take. Um, and went back into framing and construction and started my own company. And it's the, the short story is I stayed doing that all my life until I was 46. Mm -hmm. And right in the middle of, well, not the middle. Yeah, probably the middle of the recession. We had lost everything, my wife and I. And... Uh, found that it was, I mean, there was really nowhere to go at that point. I couldn't get a job. I had no college degree. I mean, even guys getting a job at the, that the school district had to have a college degree at that time because there were so many to choose from. So the one time in my life I needed a college degree, I didn't have it. So I had to go out and do something else. I ended up going to a uh, real estate investment club meeting and at that point, my wife had actually gone back to Japan with my youngest son because she just needed to get away for a while. We were literally broke, still had our house because they couldn't foreclose on it very quickly. I mean, we were there for a year without making a payment until we got a, 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 a loan modification. And uh, she's in Japan. I'm at my wits end. I think she's going to, you know, maybe not come back and Lo and behold, someone said something about mobile home investing. And I went out the next day, hit up probably 40 mobile home parks, found a mobile home for $100, found the money to rehab it, did it all myself, and sold it for $17,000. That is how I got into real estate. Wow. That's crazy. And, I had no idea. Yeah. And that was, 
that was the beginning. We had several deals that went bad after that. We mm -hmm. stuck with it. So. so Mark, at first, when you said 12 years, 12 years old, I heard, I, I, I thought you were saying our company's 12 years old, but you no. literally started at 12. Yeah, I went to work. At 12. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So going from a contractor, that's yeah. interesting. So you did that, like, are we talking just straight? Was it single family homes you were doing and buildings? Like, are you doing the whole nine yards? I, I am a, you, yeah. I'm a shiny object guy. And I, I did, I did really well with it, but yeah, I skipped from thing to thing. So mm -hmm. I started off as a framer, you know, I framed houses and apartment complexes, yeah. went into handyman work when I started my own thing, ended up doing big commercial projects uh, did a stint as a woodshop teacher at Hollywood High School for three years. Um, at one point, got my teaching cr uh, credential. It was really easy to get. It was mm -hmm. some night classes and yeah, it was nothing. And uh, went back into construction. And when I met my wife, Yuko, I owned a chain of koi pond stores. We installed decorative koi ponds and uh, she was a landscape contractor. And that's how we met. She came into my store. And so that was the last job I had, except for a couple of other little things during the recession before I became an investor full time. So that was basically the best decision that you've, you've made while on the job. Is that what you're saying? Is she listening? Yeah. See what I'm doing, man. I got you. I got you. you got me. Oh man. Yeah. You know, me all plugged in. <laughs> it was the best thing that ever happened to me. She's the one that allowed me to focus on something long enough to get it started and then she'd take over and sh I'd be off on something else. So it worked really well. So that's interesting. So during that time, and I'm very, I'm very curious to hear this, Mark, because you sure. said you're a shiny object guy, which I don't know that there's something, I think people make it sound like it's a bad thing, but in the lab, it's not because what I always preach about, and I'm sure you can maybe agree with me on this is you've got to experiment different things then you can double down. And, and a lot of people ask, like, sometimes even in my space is, hey, you know, I want to get into real estate. And it's like, well, what what kind of real estate? Because there's so much. It's so broad. Right. Right. So yeah. now I want to preface by going back and saying, so shiny object, which is, I think is fantastic for a practitioner, mm -hmm. as long as you're going to dive in at some point and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, allow the compound effect to occur. So within that, mm -hmm. Did, did, was it still within contracting or did you like, cause I'm curious as a contractor, you must be seeing flippers. You must be seeing a lot of things. Did you st get a taste of that? Or you're just like, no, I'm going to do framing. I'm going to do things within the contracting, I guess, umbrella. Cause I'm not too familiar with how large. Are you that talking umbrella is. about during the time I was a contractor? Yeah, or yeah exactly. Thinking? Exactly. Yep. During that time. Cause you said you're really, I, yeah. uh, we, we did a, did a two year stint where we were doing massive electrical projects for big commercial buildings and uh, another time we were just pouring nothing but concrete for a couple of years it just what was available then it grew and then mm -hmm. something else came up I, I i did okay i could have done better concentrating mm -hmm. but i did okay yeah okay. I, I made a decent living for sure awesome and and as far as the pulling together when you're a contractor, so I was just getting so much knowledge for a contractor which i'm telling we're doing a flip here in, in yeah. atlanta and just the amount of knowledge is crazy, but um, who, where did that knowledge come from? Was that from the family or, or was that just along the time bringing somebody on board with you to work or? You know what? Just, just learning. If you're interested in something, you can yeah. learn it. If you're not, you won't. That's okay. the bottom line. Um, so you pretty I, much ran the show. Well, I'm 57. So when I was in construction starting, it was sink or swim. Now I think there's, apprentice programs there were then two for for union jobs but we weren't union yeah so basically you started off with a broom in your hand or a shovel in your hand and that was that was and then you had to watch what people were doing and then maybe they'd let you you know frame a wall and then they put you back on the broom so it was just learning by doing and eventually you know the boss would hand you a nail bag and and say okay i want you to do this now and you just kind of worked your way through. You, there was no, there was no formal education. There was yeah. no informal education. It was just watching and learning and, you know, trying to get that damn broom and shovel out of your hands. That's, that was the biggest thing right there is, is nobody wanted to be that guy. So. Uh, absolutely. So you put a hundred bucks into mobile home. 
and yep. you're getting 17,000 of it. Something's working here. Do you double down on that or is there another opportunity that came? That oh yeah. Work? Yeah. Before I was done with that, I found another one. Um, but keep in mind, I was broke during that time. So I, I had gotten a credit card in the mail and I had a lot of, I, I call it full tilt. When you've got your credit maxed out, credit cards maxed out, I call it full tilt. Yeah. All my credit cards were on full tilt at that time uh, and some. And somebody decided they were going to send me a credit card with a $2,500 limit on it right after I bought that. Because I had no idea how I was going to fix it up. I just, I just knew I wanted to do this thing. And, but I, I bought it. I was excited. Yuko wasn't here. She was still in Japan. And I figured, you know, I got to figure out a way to get some money. And lo and behold, a credit card came. And um, I was able to borrow the rest, uh, a couple of thousand dollars. And uh, we did that. I lost money on the next two mobile homes. Didn't just lose money. My partner kind of cut me out of the deal after I did the construction work. Um, but meanwhile, I had bought another mobile home at this park for the same terms, you know, $100. And uh, I think we actually paid a little bit more than that, but it wasn't much more. And uh, we did that on our own. And we made good money on that one. And then we went to a house, made a couple of thousand dollars because we partnered with somebody who still, we did, still had no money. But during this time, Yuko was um, doing blogging in Mail Magazine, uh, in, in, in Japan, they call it a mail magazine. So she was talking about real estate and she flew over to Japan. She had come back home by then, thank goodness. And uh, she flew back to Japan and she had six or seven people show up to this little impromptu meeting she, she put on in Tokyo and was talking about having them purchase properties in the United States, but a lot of them didn't want to do it. And they asked, you know, can she was showing the flips we were doing, the mobile homes. And they said that they wanted to do that. So that was our first private capital. And oh. um, that became her thing. Um, there was a couple of things she really excelled at, um, amongst other things she's really good at. And one of them was raising private money. So, and I'm sorry, if I get off on a tangent, you bring me right back. Oh, you bet I will. But this is, no, this is no, this is great. I, that, that's so interesting because I, I want to tie. I, I have to say I do a good job of tying pieces together. Yeah, I so know. I'm you. tying. So I'm, I'm tying you. them. <laughs> but so that's interesting. I'm, I want to get to that in a second for yes. the Yuko's uh, connection with the blogging. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the hundred dollars to seventy k. I'm still trying to like hang. My, I'm okay. Still so still trying okay, to me, hang the thought on that. Like, let, let me set. Let me set. Yeah. Set, set the stage. Yeah. So I, I I'm. I'm going in uh -huh. to these mobile home parks with no experience flipping anything, no right. money, and probably desperation all over my face. And so pretty much everybody was booting me out. Mm -hmm. And I got to this one place and this lady said, you know, we've got one we're getting ready to pull out. I go, okay, I'll take a look at it. And she goes, really, there's no point. And I said, ah, yeah, well, let me look at it anyway. So we walked down, it's an old 1960 single wide, the guy had passed away a year before the roof had collapsed. There was literally pigeons living inside and cats and junkies had been using the bathroom. This wasn't the nicest mobile home park. And, and she said, I don't think you can do anything with it. And I said, well, you'd be surprised. And so she said, let me talk to the, to the park manager. There's, Usually on these parks, there's a manager at the park, and then there's a, a, a manager for the manager, like a company right. whom this guy, this guy actually I'm still in touch with uh, quite often. Um, he ended up calling me and asking how much experience I had. And I said, I've got a lot of experience. And he said, well, can you, can you get me some uh, referral letters, something like that? And I said, absolutely. I said, can I get them to you tomorrow? And he said, yeah. And I hung up the phone and I went, oh, crap. So... <sighs> I went to a couple of the mobile home parks that I'd been to earlier than the previous day and where I'd actually kind of had a rapport with the people and I had them, I asked them to write a referral letter for me. And, and, they and what, what, what were they looking for, Mark, in that letter? I'm curious. Like the, to, know that I had, to know that I had, ex had experienced flipping mobile homes and didn't leave any projects in the middle of the project. And I got uh, these because, ladies to write those for me. It was amazing. 
Wow. Yeah. Talk about action. So, and I'm, and I guess the, the, the risk management here for him was just that you know, they don't want somebody coming to their park, doing a half, half flip and then maybe not having the and funds. Then leaving. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, because I also negotiated in zero space rent for four months and that's <laughs> mobile home parks. Don't do that. Can so. you explain that, what, what, what that would mean in the impact of space rent for those okay, of you? So including I, bought myself, mobile, I bought the mobile home for a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would imply that I will now be owning that and paying space rent and utilities. But I didn't have the money to pay the space rent. And, and I didn't know how much I was going to be able to sell it for. I had no idea. I really didn't. I just really wanted to do this. So I went off a little half cocked. So you didn't uh, have an overhead is what you're saying during oh, this. Oh, good Lord. I didn't even make a budget. No. No. That's so interesting. No. No. Is this I'm, still I, this I, lean of a business model? Oh, I'm no, curious. no, is this no, just, no, no, no. It's like, should we all get into it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Everybody should no. do this. I'm yeah. advising everybody do this. Well, no. I want to, and, and you know why this is so refreshing, Mark? Because I don't have a perspective of this, and I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not going to monopolize this entire podcast on it, but I do want to just sit on this for a little bit. Absolutely. I don't have like a, like a reference of what it's like to buy a mobile home park. So when you're telling me this, I'm like, wow, this is crazy, right? Can you tell about how it's different and maybe how you even lucked out or maybe how it oh, should I, go I, down? I, <laughs> I mean, I created my luck. We have, yes. To, I mean, let's go there. Thank you. Yeah. I've been lucky, but mostly I've been, if you want to call anything luck, I've mostly been unlucky because a lot of things have gone wrong since I started this business. But this one, I just, I needed it so badly. You have no idea how badly I needed it. I mean, we couldn't buy groceries and it was embarrassing. And I needed it so bad that during this whole time, everything was going on. I was kind of half-assed looking for things. And when she went to Japan, that was, that was my turning point. That was my aha moment. Hmm, maybe I better do some. And so I, I knew at that point that I would do what I had to do. So buying the mobile home for a hundred bucks was, was pretty symbolic for me. It was, and I always turned back to that as my turning point where I decided that I was going to make something of my life after having lost everything. And it was, it, I, I don't want to get weepy or anything like that, but it mm -hmm. was the biggest thing that ever happened to me other than marriage and the birth of my three sons. Yeah, no. What um, I love about that is, is because you're touching on a point that's, that's important is the taking action uh, and making a decision, right? And I think, you know, you talk about luck. Luck doesn't happen when you're sitting there. Luck, luck is when yeah. you go out there and you go, go ahead and create it. So I commend you for that. So true. So true. So uh, that was it, man. I mean, you know, I bought the mobile home for a hundred bucks and they were nice enough to give me space rent for free for four months. But I knew at the end of that four months, if I didn't have it finished and sold, there's no way I'd be able to afford to pay the space rent and it would go back to that. So and I knew they wouldn't screw around with me. They wouldn't give me any more time. I knew. Right. That. Okay, Mark. So when you're buying something for a hundred dollars and obviously we're going to scale that to what that would look like today. Yeah. Uh, how much would the space rent go for as from a ratio? I, I would imagine $600 a month at, at, at that time. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, so this, this whole buying price thing is where I guess I'm really just hung up on because it's, it's so low. <laughs> no one's ever going to find that again. This yeah. is in the depths of the, of, of the recession. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. No, that's no I mean, kidding. We may see it next year, but you know. <laughs> so fast forward, are you still doing uh, mobile home parks or, or anything no, like that? Uh, I'm, I'm always looking to buy a mobile home park at this point, but I haven't found anything. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little overcautious when it comes to buying things. Um, I haven't found anything that fit the criteria, but, uh, I'm always looking for opportunities. And oh, okay. And I'm, I'm glad you said that. And maybe I'm glad I, I asked cause I'm, I'm learning here on the fly with the rest sure. of the listeners. Do you buy a mobile home park? I know that's possible. Yes. Or do you buy the mobile home? Like, um, I know is it? people, I know people that are very successful at flipping mobile homes. I got out of that after the, the fourth one. And went to homes. I started flipping houses after that. Um, everybody wants to graduate to flipping houses, but I'll be honest with you: if you can, if you can do it well, mobile homes is a is a much better. I don't want to get. I don't want to go down that too far, but flipping mobile homes is one of the better ways to begin flipping. So how do I? How if you, Mark, you own yes. a mobile home park? Yes. 
And I'm assuming the way I understand the model, because I'm not familiar with it, is you own all the spaces, right? And you're Correct. leasing the spaces out. You own the land. Yeah. You own the land. Okay, great. Great distinction. So you own the land. I come in and I'm just Ruben and I don't have any affiliation with you. I don't, I don't own any of the spaces. Who am I going to? Am I going to you to do the flip or am I going to the mobile well, you would, owner? You, I was looking for park owned, which means that someone passed away. Uh, there was some sort of a distress. They repossessed it because of lack of, of, of space rent, whatever the case may be. Most often you'll go to the owner of the mobile home and you'll purchase it and you'll go to the office and they have to approve the purchase. And then they also have to approve the buyer. So that's it's like an HOA, almost like a everything you do is going to be hard, right? We all know that. There's yeah. it's like flipping's easy, except and you know buying apartments. Got to get a permit, and you got to get yeah. yeah. This is like your 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 permit version of. So yeah, there's all kinds of things that come up with that. So I can tell you a lot of stories, but we don't have time for a lot of mobile home stories. I mean, we have as much time as you want. You control it, but. I mean, we could go deep into that, but there's people out there that are that are more informed on mobile homes than I am right now. Yeah. So, so tell me now, you're wearing a lot of different hats and we fast forward. And like I yeah. said, you're also an agent. Are you actively using your license to, was it strategic to maybe list your own flips or what was it? Is there a connection there? I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I think, I think, I think so far this year I've, I've done, one listing for one of our flips and mm-hmm. I did sell a high end, high end property in Newport beach nice. uh, this year. And, and the flip was a high end property. So I, I paid myself a commission out of that. That was nice. nice. I got a check to me. Usually it goes to the company, but I got a check. Um, actually it goes to the, uh, the S corp. So I really didn't get a check, but um, uh, so yeah, I did that. Yuko has one in, in, um, escrow right now for one of her Japanese investors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that, that's, I would say if if you had to look at source of income, that might be a hundred thousand, 150,000 a year. It's not, um, it's good money, but it, in in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's a lower level. We could make more if I concentrated on high end, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I like, I like spending time wholesaling and flipping and, and buying, buying and holding. Quite Got it. And that was going to be my next question is that sure. more or less the comes in kind of like a package right now, what you're doing, where I was going to yeah. ask where you spend the most energy, where, where would you say that is right now as of 2020 in the current times or consuming this, it's I think what June 17th yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. We're halfway through. It's crazy. And, um, and yeah. So what is the, the, the course of, I guess the foundation where you think you're, you're 80, 20 per se, is it all of the, above, all of the above or do you, is it one in particular right now? I think probably wholesaling only because it serves so many purposes. Mm. Um, I can, I can, you know, we, we spend six or $7,000 a month marketing for wholesaling, but I can do so many things with it. I can, I can get cash flow from it. It's a little slow right now because people are a little weird about making decisions. It's, it feels like I'm in the middle of death Valley, but that's okay. That'll pass. We're still, we're still, we're, we're, we're staying the course. No, no Mm -hmm. problem. Um, But what wholesaling does, and I'm not, if you go to my, you know, my Instagram, you'll never hear me really talk about wholesaling because I don't want it to be about that. I feel like that's, the be all end all is owning property, right? Right. So that's my be all end all. But wholesaling allows me to find deals to hold. It allows me to find deals to flip, and it allows me to find deals that I can wholesale to other people. So it it serves all it serves all the purposes of everything I was doing before, but it's all in one. Makes sense. I love that. Yeah, because you're saying it's not the end all be all. It's actually one of the I guess the front end. Uh, yeah, strategy. It's our day job. Yeah. It's our day job. Our day job is to make money. Our, our, our long-term wealth job is to, to own property. So I'll always have a day job because that puts me in places where I find more opportunity for my night job, right? Where yeah. I can invest more money in my apartments and whatever else I'm buying right now, whatever, whatever flavor I'm on for the month. Got it. So you're, so you're in, by the way, and, and I'm not sure if we made it, me to, made this very clear but you're currently based out of orange county right california 
So what is the, uh, what does that look like when you're saying, Hey, you know, I want to take some of the capital and pour it into real estate here. Are you, it, it, does it have to be raising capital? Do you start with one and then, you know, refinance How does the leverage model look like? Cause you know how people say they're always complaining that, Oh man, it's too expensive. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. what is the West coast? What, what does it look like as an investor from the West coast? That's a great question because everybody asks that and there's not a, there's the answer that, and I'm not saying that you're asking a common question. Mm -hmm. Most people ask that for people out here, but there's no good answer for it really because it's like New York city. It's, Mm -hmm. it's hard to find properties there that make sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Unless you put a ton of, ton of money into it. So our, our, our litmus or test is, is can we buy it with nothing down? Mm -hmm. So whether that's creative financing with the owner um, whether I go out of the area, most, most of what I own is in Sacramento, California, yeah. Everybody else where Sacramento is probably. Um, and I, I buy there because things cash flow. Orange County, you, you either have to get seller financing at 0% interest, which is possible. Um, and break even basically, if you're lucky, um, or you have to put a, a lot, a lot of money down. And, and so it doesn't work really well here. We've got property here that we bought early on and uh, we're not big proponents of leveraging. It's not because we don't believe in it. It's because we've been able to raise private money enough to where we don't have to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you say, I was actually thinking that that is leverage, but I guess in your, in your terms, you're saying, when you say we're not leveraging, do you just mean that? We're not leveraging our properties. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, Got yeah, it. yeah. Exactly. Okay, great. So, so are you guys going raising capital for uh, what what type of uh, homes and apartments? Is it single families? Or are you? Um, you know what? Deals? Would, yeah. We, we don't own a ton. Mm-hmm. We don't own a ton because you know out here it's expensive. Um, even in Sacramento, it's expensive by you know you know, if you go to the Midwest, it's very expensive compared to that. Um, but we've right now, probably, I feel like kind of like we're in a vortex right now. We're, we're actively looking, but I'm a little, I'm a little leery unless I get it for, you know, 65% of value right now. And, and we're, we're, with, with the lack of inventory right now, we're not getting a lot of that. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm a little bit more careful than most people. I know a lot of guys out there that are buying up everything they see right now. And that's fine. I'm sure they'll be fine and it's all good. But I'm more of a cautious guy. And, and it's served us well, being cautious and, and staying under leveraged as far as what we owe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been good to us. It's been good to us. So I'm going to stick to my guns there, but not to say that if a good deal comes along, I'm not going to buy it. It just has to be a good enough deal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I'm very curious, actually, you said 65%. And I know that's uh, typically um, some of my investors that I work with, they'll use that, but the numbers are going to be completely different across the, across the states. What, what, what does 65% kind of get you? What's the price point when you're buying in, into your market? I'm very curious. So a low end house in Orange County right now, two bedroom, one bath, 700 Mm -hmm. square foot, low end house in, um, either Anaheim, which is where Disneyland is, which yeah. is, uh, there's parts of Anaheim that are low income and, uh, there's other areas, but, uh, 450 is, is entry level, two bedroom, one bath, 700 square foot, small lot as in is. a semi undesirable area. So, I mean, just do the math and the rents on that would be about 22 to $2,300 a month. Hmm. So it doesn't make sense does not make sense. However, if you can get creative financing where you get no payments for the first couple of years, or, you know, there's a lot of folks that own those houses that don't want to pay capital gains. So that's a wonderful way of approaching somebody that wants to sell a property that you've found who is older. I was like, guys, I understand that. Let's talk about maybe you financing it, or you you can put it in more subtle terms if you want to, but Mm -hmm. That, I mean, you think about that. I mean, even me as a 57-year-old, that, that's attractive to me. 
Absolutely. I don't want to, I don't want to pay capital gains. I just want my money to keep coming in. And most of these houses are rentals. They've owned forever and now they're getting old and the houses are in really bad shape and they don't want to deal with it anymore. So right. I come along and they go, well, yeah, that, that actually sounds pretty, pretty good. And then you can even talk them in to a lower down payment because they got to pay capital gains on the down payment. It's like, you know, I'll give you enough money to make you comfortable, but let's not go crazy. Let's, let's, let's just, and let's stretch it out. And, you know, if, if at any time you want to come to me and, uh, you know, you can't call the note, you know, our contract is not going to allow you to, to call the note, but be, feel free to come to me and, you know, ask if I'm in a position to pay off the note. And if that, if that becomes a thing, then I'll, you know, this is something I just started working on and we're getting a lot of good reaction from it. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, and then you can always buy the note later on for less money than you owe. So, you know, kind of, kind of flowing in together. So that, that's very interesting. Um, so I guess during these times, have you, are you seeing, um, what's the biggest thing that you think is like a biggest misconception that, about your marketplace? Are, are, are things really stopped or are things still going or people, you know, is there anything out there like that you might think is uh, something that, because I think we have a general con- idea that everything's, you know, maybe come to a halt. Is that the reality or are things maybe at this time as we're There's- speaking, picking back up? Well, there's reality. Mm -hmm. There's what's happening and there's reality, I guess. What's happening right now is we have, you know, crazy low interest rates. We've got nothing on the, nothing, nothing available, no inventory. So things are flying off the shelf, but is that real? You know, is that, is that real or is it just a reaction? I don't think people understand the magnitude of what is going on right now and what happened over the last two and a half months and what's going to be happening over the next two years. People have no idea. And, and I guess, and I'm, I'm not, I don't watch the news. I'm not a politician. I don't, I'm not into any of that. I'm into whatever's in my world and whatever I see. And kind of what I've seen right now is just a lack of reality on a lot of people's behalf. They, they're looking at things, as if it's going to bounce right back. Now, I don't know if real estate prices are going to go up or down or stay level. Um, I think they're going to level off and I think they may drop. But people are acting as if there's not going to be any repercussions from all the shenanigans that have been going on for the past two and a half months. And that's just not possible. So, and, and go ahead. No, I'll let you fit. Well, I was going to say, Mark, when you say that, what actions do you think people are taking? Are you saying it, the way they are buying without, like, what is it exactly that you're seeing? Yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's unbridled. It's a lack of restraint. I was at, I'm getting ready to do a seven, seven day backpacking trip um, next week to okay. just unplug from this yeah. and other things. And I was at REI yesterday. And they just opened back up. And the amount of people that were in there spending so much money and the, it, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, yeah, I'm so glad everything's finally back open, but it's almost like I, I'm feeling like this big wave's coming and it's hard for me to put it into words. I feel like we're in the middle of this big wave right now, but it's going to crash when people realize that, you know, all the stores that we see that aren't opening back up, are out of business and a lot of people are out of work. And I just think there's going to be repercussions. I can't tell you what it's going to be. Uh, and it's a gut and I go with my gut. Most of the time I go with numbers and gut now. And I just feel like something, something's, something's going to happen. And I, I would get more into it, but another time, another place, but yeah, sure. sure. That, so that's what I feel like is happening right now in our market here. It's very frothy. Um, the upper end, uh, one of the guys in my office sold a $17 million house last week. Wow. So uh, it's, there's no restraint right now. Hmm. So we'll see where it goes. We'll see yeah, it goes. I think, yeah, it's just uh, interesting to, to, to think about, you know, um, you know what, what it might be. But um, yeah, I think only time will tell at this time. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think a lot of, you know, when the tide lowers, we'll, we'll really see what's going on because, um, 
or as the expression says, we'll see who's been swimming naked, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I know who said that. So <laughs> uh, but and I'm not and I'm not worried about it because if if for for those of the you know the folks that are listening, if you're in real estate, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if 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 you build widgets, it it may affect you. But in real estate, you can do so much in up and you can do so much in down. You can do so much in a stagnant market. There's so many things you can do if you can just shift. If you can just go break free from your marketing for condos or whatever it is you specialize in and go, okay, now it's time for me to shift to something else. You got to have the ability to do that, though. You have to have a little bit of shiny object syndrome into you. You have to have to have that. You got to have it. Absolutely. So in our keeping it real segment, I want to hear from the man himself, the legend. Um, so I, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, what, what do you think, um, first of all, because you do wear multiple hats, I, I did want to ask you, if there was one uh, vertical within real estate that you had to spit, pick and stick, stick with, uh, which one would you choose and why? At this point, um, mm-hmm. I'm really enjoying the social media side of it. Um, I, I do a lot of nuts and bolts training. I'm not charging anybody for it. I'm not really doing anything with it, but I'm having a good time with it. Um, if that made money, that would be great. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, I kind of enjoy the flipping process. I don't enjoy the stress of it. And, uh, um, but I enjoy the flipping process, uh, finding properties. I'm kind of over that. Um, selling real estate. I'm kind of over that. Um, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. By the way, if anybody needs a real estate agent in Orange County, I'm your man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, flipping is 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 my first love. I don't think I'm going to do that much more of it. Yeah, just because I've found other ways that work better. But um, yeah, that and and spreading spreading what little bit I've learned over the years. Yeah, are you are you still involved in the flipping as a contractor, or you just hired that out? I hired out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I I did the first few projects and yeah you can't you know finding projects is a full-time job running absolutely. jobs is a full-time job you know that being a real estate agent is a full-time job so absolutely absolutely so it's tough to do everything definitely definitely um that's very interesting uh, what, what what do you think is the best advice mark that you've ever received uh, i don't like trick questions yeah What's a really good one did you give right now to, to the people? <laughs> to the listeners? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, the best advice that, that, that I can come up with mm-hmm. is this is hard. What we do is hard. And I don't want anyone to ever, ever think that it's not hard. It's probably one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't get easier. And I, I, I wrote something about this yesterday. It doesn't get easier. And it's just something that came to me and I'm sure someone else said it, but but you get better at it. Mm. So if you don't give up, you get better at it. You get used to making quick decisions. You get used to making hard decisions and you make money. So yeah. if you can't stick with it, don't start it because that's where you make the money is, is, is when you stick with it for a, a period of time. Who is it that said, you know, you never know. And it was probably something you put in because I read your, the stuff you write and the quotes you put in all the time. And it's like, you never know when you're one step away from victory if you quit the day before some can you that I um, love that one. Do you know which yeah. one I'm talking about? Um I it might be the one where you um and I swore you, it was yours. You usually when you're I, I, people usually quit I think right right before you know they they get to their you know whatever yeah, the, yeah. the goal might be like literally yeah. right before <laughs> yeah 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 the big breaks the know, next day yeah, but you yeah. quit when you're tired yeah so yeah you got to bang your head against the wall it's like it's like anything else and uh, the the best advice probably the best advice I ever got was get to work and that was that yeah. was from my dad get to work <laughs> it, yeah you know what do you what do you think's the worst advice to preface uh to, to piggyback that uh, what do you think is the worst advice you've ever gotten or, or one that you don't really like that you hear often because there's a lot of noise out there when we step I'll, outside I'll, this yeah. lab there's a lot of noise yeah leverage leverage your properties to buy more properties over leverage your properties because prices can't go down you know get as much as you can that is the worst thing i i can't stand that i don't mind leveraging smart i'm not i don't love it but I don't mind it. But 
there's a lot of guys out there that over leverage things and they, they do, they, they, they gauge themselves by, by how many properties they have versus how much peace they have and how much cash flow they have versus how much they owe. You know, the guy with a thousand units isn't the winner. The guy that, the guy that's the winner is the guy that can do what he wants to with his time and have plenty of money to do it. You know, it's not a thousand units that does it. It's 50 units that are run well. You know, I see so many people that say, yeah, I want to make a million dollars a month and that's grand, but what do you need a million dollars for? What, what, what do you need it for? Explain to me. I don't care if that's what you want. That's great. I love goals, but is that really your goal? You know, you read that book, uh, I read it years ago called The Millionaire Next Door. I'm not a big business book reader, but you start looking at his, his uh, statistics about people and what they do with their time, people that have money and it, spending time with grandkids, you know, doing family things, going on vacations. They're not buying jets. They're not, I know people like that. I, I hang out with those kind of people and, you know, they're no happier than I am. So I think for you, when you say you don't need it, you're more like define it, define why you need it. Is that more or less where you're going? More than likely. Yeah. If you can define why you need it, then it's fine. Yeah. Not just to throw numbers out there. Yeah. 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 Life's meant to be enjoyed. You know, if that's something you enjoy, awesome. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I love this conversation, Mark, and I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off there, Mark. Um, I just, um, I love that conversation because I think, I always like, and you'll probably see this, if you, I guess you're consuming my content or anyone yeah. who's listening is like, what are you optimizing for, right? And and I think freedom is a big one, uh, but one that doesn't really get talked about is fulfillment too. It's, it's, yes. It's fulfilled. Are you fulfilled? I love that. You're doing. I love that. Yeah. And, and w- one of the things that, you know, I've been reading about too is the uh, people, like happiness is based on, um, a determinant of happiness is autonomy, right? The autonomy to make a decision like, you know, hey, I want to take off and do this with my family. Hey, I want to do that. And I think it's really good to tie that in to mm-hmm. the, your equation as well. I don't know. I just thought I'd bring that to like, because I think you're it's no, I such love a that. wonderful topic. Uh, autonomy is wonderful. Yeah. And it's funny, people, people think that the kind of business we're in, you have a lot of autonomy. And you do have some, you do have more than most. Mm-hmm. But this is still a job, you know, it still requires us to be here, sometimes ungodly hours, as you know, I mean, how, how often have you been up till two or three o'clock in the morning pounding something out because it was due or whatever. But, you know, for me to be able to do what I'm doing next week, I, I'm not going to have any communication, I'm going to be out in the middle of nowhere for seven, six days. Is that insane? I mean, think about that. Beautiful. Think about how nervous I'm going to be for the first two days. <laughs> right? Yeah, you gotta train the mind, the body and soul to I know <laughs> to I'm unplug. <laughs> I love it. It's a great thing though. It's so I, we all need that. And yeah. and I think a lot comes from that unplugging a little bit. Maybe uh, so. Maybe yeah. so. I just hope everybody's still here when I get back. Absolutely. We're 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 not going anywhere, hopefully. And uh we hope that you have a wonderful time. So uh, I will. Um, Right. Let's 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 go into the core rapid fire questions because you just sure. mentioned the millionaire next door. That's interesting. Do you have another favorite book that pops in your mind as uh, one of your favorites? I can do a couple. I'm, yeah. I I I've got short term memory loss or whatever you want to call it. But my uh, the last book I read that meant a lot to me was Rocket Fuel. It made me realize okay. that there is a a label for me that that I'm okay with who I am. And I don't have to, because when you're, when you're a guy like me, sorry, my son is texting me. Um, when you're, when you're a, like a visionary kind of guy, yeah, you have all these wonderful ideas and everybody around you is like, oh God, here he goes again. But it's okay. It's okay to be that way. As long as you can get someone to do it for you, if you can't do it yourself, or as long as you can get it started, get the ball rolling. That's okay. It's okay to do that. That book, it it almost set me free. Now, if I can get everybody else to get on board with that, life is good. Rocket fuel. Rocket fuel, you said, right? Yeah, rocket fuel. Yeah. It talks about how you need two different kinds of people in a company. You you need a facilitator, someone to run the the details, and someone that creative has and it's not an idea, man. I, I hate that. I hate that. The idea guy. 
Um, Cause it makes it sound like, you know, Ooh, he's so flighty, but it's gotta be someone that can actually come up with ideas to get things done better and yeah. start to implement them and then pass them off. Yeah. That's like the, yeah, the creative side of the, yeah. Of the other partner. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's gotta be two, there's gotta be two or you're, or some people are really good at both. It's yeah. a rare thing. So. Right. Whatever compliments your other weaknesses sometimes, as they say, is usually. Uh, but that's interesting. I'll have to uh, read and then I'll follow up with you because maybe I don't have it quite right, but I, I'll get it right. You'll like it. Uh, You'll awesome, like it. awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Mark, what's the, uh, the, the best habit that serves you every day, you think? Uh, getting up early, running. Uh, after that, it goes to hell. So, you know, those, <laughs> so in other words, you get to do the great stuff in the beginning and then let the roll. Yeah. Take yeah. It you know, there was a, there was the meditation thing I did for a while and everything, but I, I like to get up early. Um, I like me time and I like to run with my dog and um, that gets my day going. It gets my day going and, and I like early starts and I like, I like to be out of the office by six, six thirty, and, and, and home. So. Yeah. Early and key, early and me time are key. And part of that is because no one's kind of doing this when it's early. And so you can kind of yeah, yeah. unplug, which that's what I love about early. And, and me time is, I was just having this conversation. And I want to talk about this for a second. Like we don't, we're not even wired. We're so wired to just like the majority of us. And I'm, and I'm guilty of it too. And I'm trying not to do it. And part of it is because my phone is my alarm or my alarm is my phone, I should say. Right. <laughs> it's just, you're plugged in right away to like whatever you're doing. You don't get a chance to to have a compass of like, wait, where, you know, let's just come, let, let me come down to center. And not to get so like, you know. No. No, but like that's a, that's so no and that's what i'm saying i think people don't think that it's that important like yeah. you know we work out we do all these things but we're not we're not really tapping into like it's kind of like getting an oil change like you know is the engine working like is you know your power steering like is it going in the right direction like um, well, i mean, think about i don't even know what the long-term effects of this because i do get on this shortly after i get up i have me time and then i get on it so <laughs> What are the long-term effects of what we're doing to ourselves? I don't know. I really don't know. It can't be good, man. <laughs> or a lot more, a lot more bad than good. I, I mean that, and we've seen that from uh, even from a social look. There's a lot of good. Like this, this is awesome. This, this is, is dope. Fun. This would have never happened right before. Like this is what a time to be alive. But I yeah. think that also comes with a lot of responsibility because um, this is this this used to this could power. This is the most powerful thing we've ever had. We don't even know I how know. to act. <laughs> I don't even know how to act. I'm pretending like I'm trying to figure this. I uh, yeah. You so, got to figure it out. No, I'm trying, man. That's why I'm doing these so I can soak in the knowledge from people like you, man. Vice right, versa. I appreciate Vice this. Versa. This is awesome. So, if I were to ask you, we talk about leverage. I want to hear about this, right? Yes. And, and maybe we'll talk about this too offline. Yes. You know, maybe we'll all special. Had the opportunity, would you pick one 300 unit apartment? or three apartments of a hundred units? Uh, three apartments of a hundred units. Nice. Why? Um, you know, it's funny. COVID, COVID taught me a little bit about things that I already knew. A lot of apartments, you know, you get a lot of people together and, and they become one. I mean, we've seen that with, with the way people act. You know, when so someone starts misbehaving, other people start. Have you ever been in a classroom with kids and it starts <laughs> off one kid throws something at another kid, yeah. then someone else throws, and all of a sudden it's it's hell. Is that I'm and, sorry? Is that tenants that you're? Uh, when I connect the dots here, <laughs> is yeah, that <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going. I'm circling the wagon. We're going back to the tenants. So oh I've gosh, heard of people that have now. Thankfully, I haven't had this issue mm -hmm. because we've stayed on top of it. At least my managers did. There's no way I would have ever stayed on top of it because. I know my limitations. <laughs> I had the idea, send out letters starting now, and they did, and it worked. Um, but tenants talk. And it's like, you know what? I heard, you know, Jimmy down the street's not going to pay his rent because, you know, we shouldn't have to pay rent to the man. We shouldn't. We shouldn't have to do that. You know, no one else is paying rent. We shouldn't pay rent. Look what's going on in Chicago and San Francisco. They're not paying rent. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's why Rick German likes single family homes. He goes, there's no, 
There's no no shenanigans oh. like that going on. Um, so just like the takeover of the building. Yeah, yeah. So three 100 unit apartment complexes, I'd be much happier with. And also keep in mind, you've got better leverage opportunities. You can leverage one property. You don't have to leverage all three. Um, you can sell one much quicker than you can sell a 300 unit, more than likely, because as the price of property goes up, your buying pool goes down. Um, there's, I could go on all day, but there's a million different reasons why. And, you know, I, I just would rather spread out. I, I, when, we were, when we were doing turnkey in Memphis, we had so many opportunities to buy three, four, 500 unit apartment complexes for nothing. You know, we're talking five, $6,000 a unit. And this is back in uh, probably 2011, 2012. Um, and we, we were working, me and my partner at the time, we're working so hard on those and we ended up buying a small one and we rehabbed it and we sold it, made a little bit of money. And we said, you know what? I think that's it. I don't know what's going to happen here, but, uh, uh, and I'm glad we didn't, but yeah, big, big apartment complexes. I don't know. That's interesting. That's, that's nothing. But I, you know, what's funny. You, you, uh, I asked this question to almost every guest that comes on and this was a very elaborate answer and a very, uh, very different one. So I appreciate that. And with the time, the way you kind of tied COVID together. I think that's, that's very key. Um, very yeah. interesting. We're, so, all learning, we're all learning new things right now. Yeah, we are indeed. So uh, ongoing. Um, welcome to my world. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to piggyback on that. Sure. Cause you mentioned the mark based on the market that you're in. This is interesting. Cash flow versus or equity. Which one do you pick? Ah, well, I knew I, this would get, I, this would be a good one for you. Cause I could, I could tell you, you know, when you, returning. yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, both, both. Uh, I know. <laughs> um, well, I'm, you know, again, you know, owning properties is the be all end all right. Mm. And so why do we own properties? We can't spend equity. I mean, we could technically, but I don't do that. So I have to say cash flow cause I don't, I don't use my equity to buy other properties. Okay, that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, are you are you the kind to try to try try to pay it off and for pass it down a legacy? Like, is that the idea, or is that what you're optimizing for? Or just to because no, no, no? Not, I'm not not worried about paying it down. I'm worried about worried about it cash flowing. Um, if it pays down, much better. I don't want to get in a position. See, the only way you can be in a, a good position with rental properties is if you do pay them down. Because that makes you recession proof. It makes you depression proof. It makes you COVID-19 proof. Nothing else will do that other than paying those properties off. Am I a proponent of paying properties off? Not really because properties go up in value, right? So at least in my area, the places I invest, I, I invest in areas that appreciate. I do that on purpose. And so I don't buy for appreciation. I buy for cash flow, but appreciation is the cherry on top. But because of appreciation, my rents go up, my my debt in in reality, my debt's going down, right? You know, if you look at it as a percentage of the value of the property. So life is grand. Um, in the Midwest, where properties don't move up and down so much, it's a bit it's a different story. But you know, where I'm at with what I do, it's 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 cash flow. Sorry, long answer. Like no, oh, but it's so good because I've actually never, and you know, I have a lot of people step in the lab. I haven't really heard someone put it like that, where the appreciation is actually, you know, your I guess the that not the that's a yeah the that the debt coverage ratio. It's a bonus. It's a bonus. It's well, a bonus. it's a bonus, but I'm saying the way you discussed about the the ratio of the debt is actually going down. That's really interesting because even if you're interest only, yeah. Yeah, you don't owe as much percentage-wise as you did two years ago because mm -hmm. the value's gone up. You may still owe 200000 but now it's worth eight hundred, whereas before yeah. it was worth five. So, um, you know, I have a story. Do you mind if I tell a, a really fake, a fake story that I made up to try to explain something? Because everybody was asking about market timing, mm -hmm. and it pisses me off because – there's no such thing. You can't time it. I can't time it. Nobody can time it. Can you be careful? Yeah. 
-hmm. Can you buy at a better discount because the market might be frothy? Yeah. Can you time the market? Tough, very tough. Because if the interest rate, interest rate ticks down, what just happened? You know, property values went up. You know, that's just the way it works. That's, yeah. it, it's, you know, because because there's more people that want to buy. Anyway, so neighbor Joe lives next to me. My neighbor, my house was built in 1962. Neighbor Joe bought brand new in 1962 for 15000 Neighbor Joe's a pretty cool dude. And neighbor Jim on the other side of me bought in 1965, but he paid 30000 And everybody in the neighborhood laughed at neighbor, neighbor Jim, right? He's what an idiot. You know, we all we all paid fifteen, and this jackass paid twice as much. He paid thirty, and you know he's still known as that crazy guy that paid twice as much as everybody else. But those freaking houses are worth nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars now. So I don't care when you buy. I don't care how much you overspent. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You buy at the top. You buy at the bottom. You buy in the middle. You buy at a high interest rate, you buy at a low interest rate. Time heals all real estate mistakes for the most part, unless you buy on a you know, nuclear waste site. But you know, yeah, time I, th heals. Time yeah heals. I think I think what you're you're saying, and it's important for listeners, is that you're talking about treating this like a long term game. Yeah, for um, sure. And and sure. and that's when to your point, yeah, it's an upward cycle. Yeah. And yeah. Very interesting. Um if you had one superpower, mm -hmm. which one would you pick? It's not a superpower, but because because I don't want to, I don't I don't want to know my future. I don't want. There's so many things I don't want. Don't pick don't it. Like, Tell me what you'd like. <laughs> I, I, so I you want, see what happens when you give people options. <laughs> I know you give me options. It's like, ah! it's like, here's what I don't want. I'm like, tell me what you want. <laughs> oh, give me a beer. Um, Edict. No, he just no. Um, <laughs> um, contentment. I want to. I want to have the superpower of contentment. I want being be, content. Being content. Being happy with what I've got. Being eat sauce just came. <laughs> awesome. He's like, he's he's like, like really he's saying, I don't even. I don't even drink. <laughs> Um, no contentment. I want my, I want contentment to be my superpower. I want to be content all the time. I want to be satisfied with what I've got, but want more. I want to be satisfied with where I'm at, but the desire to have more. I want to be content. Mm. It's so hard for me to be content. Oh, really? I so so with where I'm at. So is that from, um, that's weird. I don't, from know, an I don't even know where that came from, but that was, that was my answer. All right, so are you speaking from an ambitions mind? Like you're just always striving for more, and and you don't feel that you know that you're appreciating the moment. Is that it? Because that that'd a lot be of very, that, yes, yeah. a lot of that, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of us deal with that. I think a good exercise, Mark, and for ever for whoever is listening, yeah, is uh, just a right. You, you and I've heard someone say this. I can't remember where I read it or heard it, but when you write down, like just literally, and during your me time. This is for everyone who's listening. Try this tomorrow, guys. Take a piece of paper and write down what you're grateful for. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to be angry, anxious, and upset uh, or nervous when, during that exercise. It, 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 because you can't, the two emotions can't coexist. It's hard to be grateful and be like, ner no. So you take away from that energy, you take away from the anxiety, you take away from the frustrations, and just for that period, just list on every single thing. And it, I think it's a nice level ground because I think it's perspective, right? People are like, uh, well, at least you still have a business during Corona and some people lost their jobs. And like, and you know, there's just so many things where you could be like, yeah, right. but you know what? It's good to be grounded and be like, you know what? Yes, this sucks right now in my business, but at least I have this and kind of level, level set because totally. I think as, it's human nature. That's our problem. We, we elevate and we adapt so quickly that to your point, the guy who owns a jet might not be happier for those reasons because he gets accustomed to owning the jet. So then yeah. it's like he's seeking. So, and I think that's free. That's for everybody to have. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully we got that hit something in there, Mark. I could see it in your face and hopefully somebody who's listening, uh, try it out. It's really cool. No, I, I will. I will do that. I'll, I'll be up early tomorrow morning and I and will then DM it. me and we'll keep it a Full thing. Report. Well, I'll <laughs> DM you in the morning. Awesome. Did it, did it. And I'm happy. Smiley face, smiley face. Listen, my five, my five is your eight. So that's, that's right. And I'll be up. I'll be up. 
Listen, Mark, this has been grand. I can't thank you enough for coming in. But, you know, where can we find out more about you? Because you're such a wonderful, like I said, I connected with you because you. you're genuine energy. And, and just just so happy to be with you, man. So where can the listeners, if they're listening, if they're driving right now, or the, whoever's watching you, you've seen the handsome face I was trying to re- reflect as well, you know, try to little fashion statement. Um, you are a rather attractive man. <laughs> you sir where can the people find and, and follow the legend himself mark it is very difficult i am at mark ah. in real estate mark nice. in real estate on instagram yep um i am at uh, mark mcmahon on youtube nice i am at mark mcmahon on uh what else linkedin i'm at mark mcmahon on uh what's that uh, tiktok Oh, nice. I don't post right. on there too often because I'm just, it's getting to be too much. You're testing. So I'm, 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 I'm around. Uh, but Instagram is where I'm most prolific. I, like I said, I do, I do about a seven or eight minute video every day on something real estate related. So uh, how to buy, how to sell, how to raise money, all that stuff. This week I'm doing a, a pr- raising private money thing. I've done, uh, I'll do the fourth part today. Nice. I just subscribed to your YouTube channel. So if you check, you'll be, you'll see me on there. The real estate experiment is following Mark. I, I, I will look and I, yeah. and I missed my video this week. Don't tell my wife. It's all good. I know my that. My wife is very, very scheduled person. If she found I out, know. it would be held. Be held get up. caught slipping out here, Mark. We already, you already got your brownie points. We gave her a shout out earlier as the best decision no. you ever made. So make, we'll make sure we grab a snippet from that and you can play it from her. I will. That's yes. invested talent right there. That's that's our team. Dan, uh, who's going to be working on this? Or Roxy. We need a snippet, and we're going to show some love to Yuko, right? Is it Yuko? Nice. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. You heard I it. appreciate that. Dan or Roxy. Listen, guys, we're wrapping up. You heard it. Mark McMahon, the man, the legend. Uh, thank you so much for dropping in, man. And just like thank that, you. we are out. <laughs>